Chapter 1 Memories of the Land Throughout the centuries, there are a number of legendary figures that have come to us from the time of the dark. Figures such as Ith, the horrific Ragman, Vervamon the Elder, and Tividar of Thorn. Yet one figure is an enigma among those enigmas. Time and again, throughout the period of the dark and up to the end of the Ice Age itself, there is a reference to a folk figure known as Joda. It had been suggested that Joda is the surname of a family of sorcerers, or honorific title of respect, or that Joda is a previously unknown planeswalker. The fact remains that Joda, be he one or be he many, is today regarded as one of the founders of magic as we now know it. Arkal, Argivian scholar. I am cold, said Joda, huddled over the unlit fire pit. You're always cold, replied Bosca with a laugh rubbing his hands together for effect over the gathered collection of dry twigs and leaves in the stone ring pit. It's always cold, replied the youth. The whole world is cold. Well, it's not going to get any warmer, said the teacher. So you might as well give in and show me that you know what to do about it. Light the fire. Banish the cold. He waved an arm over the fire pit, his worn sleeve flapping in the chilly evening breeze. Joda stared at the lumpish bundle of tinder with something that felt like hate. Hate of the cold. Hate of the present situation. Far from civilization. Far from family. Hate of Bosca for putting him in his present circumstances. For taking him on this godforsaken route. And hate for himself. For going with this self-described wizard in the first place. The bundle of tinder at the base of the shallow pit remained untouched by his anger. If sheer force of will determined how magic functioned, then Joda would already be a powerful mage. More powerful than Bosca, More powerful than Jarsal the legendary wizard in his family tree, and more powerful than even Urza and Mishra, the bringers of the devastation, more powerful than anyone. But mere willpower, or anger, or hatred, did not unleash magic, Bosco would say. And he would say it, Joda realized, if Joda did not try something fairly quickly. There were other paths that led to magic, and his time as Bosco's apprentice taught him that much at least. Joda attempted to unfurl his brows. He knew that Bosco could light the fire with but a few words, and the errant wave of a hand. But that wasn't the point, was it now? The idea was for Joda to light the fire without flint or tinder or anything other than his own mind. It was a test, and Joda hated tests more than he hated the cold. Joda straightened his shoulders and shook his head, trying to clear the irritation and anger from his mind. His dark hair, long and worn loose since they had fled from the coast, grazed his cheeks as he moved in a tender caress. The motion did little to unclutter his thoughts. But the action felt good. It felt right. That, too, was one of Vasca's instructions about how magic worked. It felt right. Joda took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Whenever you want to start, said Vasca, leaning back and regarding the dark-haired lad through slitted eyes. Joda wondered if the older man was laughing at him. Probably. Vasca was regularly amused by most things he encountered, particularly Joda. The lines at the corners of the old man's face showed that he laughed regularly. I like to cook these hairs before the witching hour strikes, said Vasca, offhandedly, motioning at the skinned and clean rabbits laying out on a flat rock, waiting only for a kiss of a flame. Joda stared at the bundle of tinder again, but now he was not looking at it. Instead, he was looking beyond it and was thinking of the land. That was one of the keys to magic Vasca had stated early in his apprenticeship. The land held its power close to its bosom, the older man had said, and waited only for one with the talent and the will and the patience to call it forth. That involved memories, coming to know the land as one knew one's own self. Better, perhaps, in Joda's case. Joda thought of the mountains above the ancient family estates. Memories of the mountain held great power, Bosca said, of flames and of storms. Fire was from the mountains, and memories of those mountains could be harnessed to create flame. Joda has seen Bosca do it a hundred times. He had been walked through the process step by step on chilly nights such as this one, but this was the first time Bosca had expected him to do it on his own. The memories of the mountains would not come. The hazel-tinted ranges were visible from his family's land, but they were always remote, always standing sentinel on the western horizon. They were the lands of the dead dwarf kingdoms and new tribes of goblins and orcs. The mountains were recognized and respected, but they were also feared. Bosca had no fear of the mountains. He claimed to have been raised among the Kerr peaks, and the mountains were his home. Instead, Joda thought of his homeland many leagues behind them. He thought of the farms and orchards and gardens of Giva province. When his great-great-grandfather, the mighty Jarsal, was Joda's age, one could ride a full day in any direction 
and still encountered landholders who owed fealty to their family and the manor grounds brought rich harvest of apples, cherries, and cranberries. Even when his grandfather Thargan was alive, the harvests were plentiful and tithes brought by the farmers were enough to enjoy a good life. Yet by Jonah's lifetime, the family orchards were overgrown with weeds and the surrounding farms were mostly barren, overfarmed during the increasingly short summers and for the most part turned to pasture. The manor house had been built by Jarsal's mother after the devastation, but the passing time had done it in. When he last saw it, on the cold rainy day, when the family finally abandoned it, its supports had rotted dangerously, and its slate roof bowed precariously in the middle. Part of Jonah's mind told him to put aside the thoughts of the manor and the old farms, for the fire magic he saw lived in the mountains. Yet once begun, he could not break away from the reverie of home. He would never see that home again, he knew, and he would probably never see his surviving family either. Yet from the memories of his homeland, there came a light, like a door opening in Jodah's mind, or dream remembered. That was the magic he knew, the mystical wishing power that drove all spell casting, the stuff that fed the engine of dreams. It was not mountain magic, filled with heat and angry stone, but rather pouring from his memory of the surrounding farmlands and plains. Jodah could smell the winds of a brief, warm summer, sweeping over the sun-dappled fields of grain, and he heard the scream of a lonesome summer hawk. It was the wrong type of energy for lighting fires, but it was all he had, and it came unbidden now. To contain it, to deny it, would damage him, Joda knew, for that was another of Vasca's first lessons. Joda pulled on the energy, drawing it from his memories like a spinner pulls thread from the wheel. Part of his mind saw the tinder in the fire pit, but part of his mind was elsewhere, back on the family's manor, listening to his grandmother speak of the days when the land was in its glory. He gathered together and focused it on the gathered clump of leaves and small twigs. Then, something inside him, at the base of his brain, moved. Across from Joda, Bosco was viewing the lad through half-closed eyes, half expecting the boy to suddenly shake his head and admit defeat. Bosco remained silent through Joda's preparation and meditation, though usually he would seek to coach, focus, and direct the boy's thoughts. If the lad could light the fire, then he learned his lesson well. If he could not, well, they were far enough from civilization not to attract too much attention and close enough to get Joda to a church healer if he did damage himself. Bosco wanted the boy to succeed, but did not want to walk him through the entire process. Not this time. He had told Joda for the past year and a half that a wizard should think things through and not depend on anyone, not even his teacher. Bosco felt the lad had promised, though he started his studies extremely late, at the age of 15. Still, Joda showed an aptitude to the craft and had the blood of old Jarsal in him, and Jarsal was a legendary wizard in his own right. Bosco started from his reverie, as Joda's eyes suddenly widened with his lean, boyish face. The young man rocked forward, his hands splayed wide. That was not how the spell was supposed to be cast. Something was wrong. A great ball of light incandescent around the bundle of tinder beneath Joda's hands, glowing hotter and wider by the second. Bosca shouted a warning, but his voice was drowned out by a crackling, not of lightning, but of light itself, sparking and beating on the air in the heart of the fire pit. The light bleached all color from their surroundings, the trees, the stones, even Joda's faded silk vest, was reduced to a series of white patches and black shades. In another moment, the light rose from the fire pit, like a phoenix ascending from its flaming nest, burning its way through the canopy of trees above them. The ball trailed a plume of light, and rose perhaps twenty feet. Then, it exploded, soundlessly, in a still brighter flash. Bosca threw an arm up in front of his face, his eyes screwed tight, and still, he could see the flash of the glowing ball as it detonated. The after image of the light ball still burned Bosca's eyes, and he had to blink away the bluish flash from his vision. When he had regained his vision, he saw that the slender young man was already hunched over the pit, studiously feeding the flickering flames at the base with small bits of kindling. The passage of the light ball through the fire pit had ignited the tinder. Bosca scowled and opened his mouth to reprimand the boy, but did not know what to say. Joda had lit the fire after all. Finally, he said, you weren't concentrating on the mountains, were you? Now it was Joda's turn to blink. After a while, the younger man nodded and said, It felt right. Isn't that what you always said? That it should feel right? Bosco looked stonily at the boy, then said, I said that once, back when I still had my sight. Now, beat the fire while I finish preparing the hairs, unless your little display brought them back to life and frightened them away in the process. Then, after dinner, We'll talk about this. 
Vasca turned away from the young man, half to fetch the hairs, and half to conceal the broad smile that threatened to break across his weathered face. Vasca was sure that as soon as his back was turned, Joda was smiling as well. How does a mage keep track of his spells? said Joda, after they finished the hairs and dug the last of the new potatoes from their shallow graves beneath the fire pit. It was dark and starless, the continual clouds reducing the world beyond their fire to varying patches of blackness. Most nights were overcast and starless on Tarissier these days. Wizards keep track in a number of ways, said Vasca. Some mages wrap them within songs and verses that hold mnemonic clues. Some attach mental significance to various items of their clothing. There are mages along the southern coast, near ancient Almaz, who wear large vests festooned with buttons. They continually fidget with the buttons, reminding themselves of every spell they ever cast. Some chaos wizards don't bother to remember at all and call up the spells as they need them. I have done that on occasion. There was a pause as the young man digested the information. What about books? He said at last. My grandmother once said that her father had a number of books on the subject, though they've long since disappeared. Can you write your spells down? Yes and no, replied Bosca, warming to the conversation. Writing down a spell is like trying to write down a dance. It can be done, capturing every nuance of the dancer, but it does not translate well from the stage to the written page. The same applies to magic. You can describe it. You can attempt to explain it. You can even teach it. But without the magic itself present, you cannot truly utilize it. I've seen a number of magical texts over the years, and they range from scholarly tomes on the nature of mana and its connection to the land to useless concoctions of folk rumors and superstition. The most useless are volumes that explain magic to those who already understand it. A book like that is as valuable as a text that teaches a fish to swim. All such tomes, of course, are banned by the church. Another pause. Then Joda said, How do you keep track of your spells? Bosca allowed himself a sly, almost wolf-like grin. I imagine a large tower set among the Kerr ridges where I grew up. Each of the rooms of my mental tower had a balcony overlooking the mountains, the mounts from which I draw my power. In each of the rooms, I keep one of the spells I use. Joda thought about that for a moment. He thought of the old manor, settled among cracked flagstones and weed-choked gardens. He thought of the entranceway, a broad expanse of yellow granite and cracked jet that had seen generations of muddy feet. He placed a spell, the light ball, at the foot of his wide staircase that had been built with the house itself. He mentally closed the door of the memory house again. Bosca reached over his saddlebag and pulled out a small silvery disc about the size of his palm. He offered it to Joda over the fire, and the younger man took it carefully. In the light of the fire, Joda could see his own reflection in the disc. Long black hair swept loosely back over his ears, black eyebrows over piercing dark eyes. He looked closely at the stubble on his face, the first attempts at a beard and mustache framing his thin-lipped mouth. He pursed his lips into a thin line. It's a mirror, he said simply. Observant as ever, said Vasca, a smile on his voice. It predates the devastation, which is true for almost all things that are worth half a damn these days. The hedge wizard, who first taught me magic, gave it to me after I cast my first real spell. Now I'm giving it to you for the same reason. Is it magical? Joda's eyebrows peaked above his narrow nose. Vasca laughed. Everything is magical, he said. The skein and the weave of magic flows through us, like it flows through the land. But does it work magic? said Joda. Vasca replied. Depends on the magic you want to work. Some mirrors are used for divination. Some are used for meditation. And this one? His voice trailed off. What do I use it for? prompted Joda. Reflection, said Vasca, and laughed again. Joda felt the blood rush to his face, and Vasca added, Don't be angry, lad. That's the same thing my first teacher told me. Well, he told me a lot of things, like the mirror being part of a machine found abandoned in the desert, or that had come from Ashna the uncaring slave pits. I found it was good to see myself as others see me, on occasion, and I think it will be good for you as well. Joda looked at the mirror again and saw the reflection of a young man not quite a boy any longer, but not quite an adult. Vasca meant well, but a small jibe still bothered Joda. Regardless of its heritage, the mirror was solid and cool and unlike anything made these days. The boy nodded and changed the subject. 
Why are books about magic banned? He asked. Ah, said Bosca, finishing the last of a potato and looking around to see if any escaped their feast. That would be the church. They do the banning. But why does the church ban them? Pressed Joda. Bosca flashed a grin again. The church wants to ban everything, he said. It gives them something to do with their priest. Joda said nothing. Instead, staring into the embers of the fire. Bosca added softly and seriously, They are afraid of magic, you see. They try to ban what they cannot control. We control magic, said Joda. Or try to. But they do not control us, said Bosca. And they are afraid of what magic can do to them. Joda closed his eyes, trying to parse out Bosca's logic. But we aren't a threat to the church. We don't care what they do. You don't know that, said Bosca. And what they don't know, they are afraid of. That makes no sense, said Joda, sighing. Neither does the Church of Tao, said the older man, smiling as if Joda had made his point for him. Then he added, You know of the devastation. Joda felt as if he was being treated like a child. Everyone knows about Urza's devastation, he said curtly. Also of Mishra's devastation, said Bosca quickly. Also called the Brothers' War. Also called the Antiquities' War. I know the stories, said Joda, and the hurt did not disappear from his voice. Then tell me a story, said Bosca, in the dying light of the campfire. Tell me what happened. Joda was quiet for a moment, then said, There were these two brothers, Urza and Mishra. They fought each other, trying to rule the world, and they changed the world in the process, devastating it, destroying the land sank whole islands, burned whole cities. The world is colder and darker and more dangerous now because of what they did. Some stories say they killed each other. Others said that one killed the other, then went insane, and fled to find new lands to destroy. They were powerful wizards, said Vasca. They weren't wizards, said Joda. My grandmother told me the stories, and she said they weren't wizards. They were powerful, and they had great machines, but they weren't wizards. Wizards are different. Ah, that's the point, said Bosca. They were powerful, and they were different, and had abilities beyond most people, and that's why everyone thinks they were wizards. That's why the church seeks to burn the magical books, and that's why they hound the mages and put wizards and artificers on pyres. Joda looked up from the fire. Because they're afraid someone else will get as powerful as Urza and Mishra? Bosca nodded. Someone that powerful would be a big challenge to the church itself, and the church of Tao does not like competition. Something soft and heavy tipped over a tree root slightly downhill of their encampment. There was a rough, throaty laughter, followed by numerous slushing noises. Then, more guttural laughter, this time muffled. Joda looked quickly at Bosca, and the older man rose quickly, more quickly than Joda had ever seen him move in a year and a half. The older man's face was no longer smiling, and his hand strayed to his hip, as if to grip a sword that no longer hung there. What? Joda started to ask, but the old wizard waved him curtly to be quiet. Goblins, said Vaska, in a voice no more than a whisper. Move up, Hill, behind me, and keep quiet. He bit off the last word sharply, and Joda nodded and quickly scrambled uphill into the brush, slipping the mirror inside his high-top boots as he did so, and pulling a short knife from the same boot in the process. He knelt beside a large bowl twisted trunk of an ancient oak. Down the hill, there were more voices, rough and guttural, trying to form human speech without the proper vocal cords. Oi! The fire! said one at last. Anybody home? Hello! The darkness! came Vasca's voice in return, strong and confident, the smile in his voice again. Only a simple traveler who desires his solitude, nothing more or less. There was a rough laughter again, from down the slope. Joda stared into the darkness, straining to see the green-skinned creatures. He had seen goblins before, or rather their skins, stretched over wooden frames as hunter's trophies in Giva. No matter how many had been killed, there always seemed to be more of them. Goblins usually stayed in the mountains, unless they were on a raid, and the nearest human farmstead had to be miles away. Why would they? Joda's heart dropped into the pit of his stomach. Of course. They saw the light. The goblins were going to a raid, or returning from one and saw the beacon he had created rising above the forest. They had seen the light, and they had followed it to the source. Followed it to them. The voice from down the slope was talking in. You got any food for us? 
Fosco laughed, and it was the easy laugh he used with bureaucrats and merchants. I had some rabbit earlier, but you are too late, I'm afraid. I have a small fire here if you're cold, but otherwise, there is nothing here that would interest you. You best be on your way. There was something muttering down slope, and Joda poked his head farther from the tree. Bosco was standing calmly, his back to Joda's hiding place, the fire pit between himself and the goblins. Maybe there ain't nothing for us, said the voice. And maybe there is. I think we want to come find out. You're not welcome, said Bosco simply. And you have been warned. Again, the laughter, and there was a motion among the brush, and the first of the goblins stepped into the firelight. The goblin was a mockery of the human form, naked to the waist and wearing rags around its hip. Its skin was green and warty, and unlike the leathery hides Joda had seen in the cities, its tough flesh was stretched smooth and tight over well-muscled sinews. The creature was shorter than Joda, but stockier, with hunched broad shoulders and arms that almost dragged on the ground. It carried a cudgel in both hands, and Joda noted that the tip of it was smeared in some dark, sticky-looking substance. The goblin's mouth dominated its face, more of a muzzle than a mouth, and was filled with sharp teeth that splayed in random directions. Heavily muscled brows shaded deep-set, bloodshot eyes, and its ears were like a mule's, jutting in opposite directions from the top of its head. You're not welcome either, said the goblin with a snarl. And that is your warning. Other shadows began moving out from among the brush. Bosca made a single motion with his hand, waving outward palm up, like a farmer sowing a field with seed. Yet, instead of crops, there blossomed hundreds of small jets of flame from the ground at the feet of the lead goblin and around his compatriots. The lead goblin squealed as its rags caught fire and it dropped its weapon and began slapping at its thighs and groins in a desperate attempt to quell the flame. The others were daunted by the fire's effect and by the flames themselves and pulled back. Cool, bellowed one of them. It's a wizard! It's a wizard there! Bosca chuckled and pointed a finger at the leading goblin. A single line of flame jutted from his finger and flew unerrily to strike the goblin in the chest. Green flesh crackled, and the goblin screamed as the fire fed off the creature's flesh. Joda could not take his eyes off Bosca. The elder mage made it look so easy. The spell of choice, the recall on the memories of the land, the few hand motions that unlocked the power, and the effects of the magic made visible in fire. Joda knew how difficult it was, and Bosca carried himself effortlessly. Later, the mage would be exhausted. But now, he turned aside a company of goblin raiders with ease. The lead goblin was little more than an animated fireball, cascading down from the side of the hill, scattering its fellow creatures in its wake. Then, everything changed. There was a twang of a bow from down the hill, and the shaft of a goblin arrow blossomed in Vasca's shoulder. Vasca raised his hand to his shoulder and cursed. His concentration suddenly gone, his spells made useless. The surviving goblin saw this and gave a deep-throated cry. Joda shouted as well clutching his knife, and rising from his position. He made two steps, then pitched forward into the soft, cool moss beneath the brush. Something had tripped him, Joda realized. He spun as he landed, half expecting some goblin scout to loom over him, ready to slit his throat. Instead, there was nothing. No, not nothing. There was a motion back near the tree line of a tall figure. Not a goblin. It was far too tall for a goblin. A hooded figure, dressed in gray and black. The figure lingered for only an instant and then it was gone. Joda raised himself up and tried to leap forward to aid Bosca, but others were converging on the scene now. There was the sound of a horn to his right, close and clean and bright. It was a human horn, a hunting horn. That was followed by the racketing sound of crossbows unleashed, at least twenty, cutting the thick foliage with their passage like angry hornets. As Joda watched, two of the goblins collapsed, white feathered arrows in their throats and chests. The remaining creatures hesitated for a moment, then fled, their morale shattered, following their flaming leader down the hill. Then, the rescuers were in the glade as well. The newcomers were dressed in fitted armor plates and stopped only briefly in the clearing to wind their crossbows or draw their weapons. Then, they disappeared in pursuit of the goblin raiders down the hill. The tunics worn over their armor were white, and their capes purple. Joda realized they were from al Sur, the next major city-state along the coast. One of the soldiers paused long enough to look at Joda as the apprentice pulled himself from the ground. Joda expected the soldier, a blonde-haired young man, no older than Joda himself, to pursue the goblins. Instead, he motioned with the crossbow for Joda to join his master. A bolt rested in the groove of the crossbow, and its string was pulled taunt and cocked. Joda got up slowly and moved toward the wounded Bosca. 
The older mage had pulled the goblin arrow from his arm and was pressing a bloodstained hand against the wound. Another man entered the clearing. This one was tall and walked with a stiff gait. He was unarmored, and his tunic was marked with twin sunbursts, the symbol of the Church of Tao. Bosco was already speaking. I cannot thank you enough for my timely rescue. We were camping here when the goblins... The unarmored man lashed out, striking Bosco square across the jaw with the back of his fist. The older man staggered under the blow, and a trickle of blood dripped from the corner of his mouth. Joda shouted and stepped forward, but the young soldier's gauntleted hand came down squarely on his left shoulder. It felt as if a vice had been attached there. The unarmored man was speaking. You stand accused of using sorcery in the lands of Alsul. There were these goblins, dear sir, said Bosca, his voice bubbling with blood. The lands of Alsur are under the spiritual protection of the Church of Tau, and under those laws you will be tried. I am Brother Tanar. You will accompany me back to Alsur for trial. He turned and motioned for the trumpeter to sound recall and bring the pursuing troops back. We've got what we came for, said Tanner, regarding both Fosca and Joda with a stony gaze. Fosca rubbed the bleeding corner of his mouth with the back of his hand. I think, he said, loud enough for both Joda and the guard to hear, we were better off with goblins. <laughs>